And welcome to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. I'm Taylor Phillips. He's Ed Smith. Man, we're going to lament and probably blow off a little bit of steam as well about the uh, Lions 49ers uh, NFC Championship choke job. Plus, this is this is the postmortem, the postmortem edition that, that we've been looking forward to do. Yeah, on Sunday night. It, it it absolutely is. So, yeah, on Sunday night. Second here. Oh, okay. So uh, we we do have some uh, positive news about the Lions. We uh, we're gonna go over uh, Tom Izzo's of seven hundred win, the Red Wings and the Pist- the Pistons and the Red Wings. So let's get to it. The Lions, uh, they had a 24-7 lead at halftime. And they uh, get outscored 27-7 uh, in the second half. 27 almost unanswered points. But but still, um, I, yeah, the fourth downs, I actually don't mind. I would have, I would have. I would have, I would not have minded either decision, but, but uh, the the uh, the analysis has to come first. It's harder. It is harder, although it's although although it's although it's makeable, but but it's still harder for Michael Bangley to try a like a forty-eight-ish yard field goal than it is, as opposed to being easier for Josh for someone named Josh Reynolds to com- to complete an easy pass, which he dropped. He he dropped two. Passes. I, I think the other one was defended by uh, when he was covered. But anyway, one catch for Josh fourth Reynolds. Down catch, four. The fourth down catch was more defended, but it was still a catchable ball that he fled out dropped. The other one was just inexcusable. It was, it was third in the uh, mic to the computer. So uh, let's continue on, shall we? Sure thing. Let's just keep keep on right where we left off. We were basically discussing on how you know the Josh Reynolds plays. You could argue that the first drop was better defended, but still very catchable ball concerning the effort that Jared Goff had made moving in the pocket to avoid pressure, avoid the sack, and step up to make the throw. He should have been rewarded by a catch. And again, a couple of drives later on third and 10, when the Lions are trying to sustain any amount of momentum, Goff had Reynolds across the middle, wide open, not only for a catch for a first down gain, but also the potential yards after the catch. And this one was an even more egregious drop. You could say it caught him in the bread basket, caught him in the stomach, whatever. It's right there. And Reynolds has been so reliable, not just for this year, but going back to last year, been so consistent, uh, making clutch catch after clutch catch, either resulting in a first down or a touchdown for most of the time. And yet, he picks the inopportune worst moment in time to sell the farm, which is what he did. And frankly, while his uh, contributions to this loss were just as bad, if not worse, um, than than what we saw in terms of the fourth fourth down calls from Dan Campbell, there were still other factors here. You know, there was still the matter of uh, Vildor. Uh, somehow not hauling in the interception, having it hit off his face mask, and then lead into another uh, lead into a crazy catch uh, for San Francisco. Also, also on Jermaine Brandon Ayuk, I believe it was Ayuk. Yes, yes, no. it was it was Ayuk. He, he, he had great awareness on that. Yeah, catch. but 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 sometimes you know luck also helps a lot too. And like I said, when when a guy has an interception, literally bounce off of his off of his helmet. And Should have caught that. Yeah, karma's, again, karma's a bitch, isn't it? Very much so. Uh, and and it delivered some hard, some hard cold, uh, cold justice in this. You know, Ayuk making that play was reminding me for some reason of the of the Jermaine Curse catch, for example, um, against against the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, though, there was no goal line stop that could have um, stopped any momentum or this rolling freight train that was San Francisco in the, third, in the second half. And once again, Taylor, that damn third quarter. We've been talking about it all year in terms of, for some reason whatsoever, where it'd be point differential, where it'd be turnover margin, uh, yards production. The Lions just always become stuck in the mud in the third quarter. And it bit them in the ass again in the worst inopportune time. You know, there's also the Jameer Gibbs fumble. Now, I love Jameer. 
you know, he had a, a fantastic rookie season. He had a big touchdown run early in the game to help set up, to help build this 24-7 lead, which came after, of course, the big opening run by Jamison Williams uh, to kick off all the scoring. So while you got to give him cra- praise and credit for that, you got to give him some criticism for fumbling that ball because that's what it was 24-17, San Francisco. They pounced on it. They immediately tied the game, and it was all – um snowballing from that from from that point forward so i'm reminded of the quote that ray lewis once said when the ravens had lost i want to say this was the 2011 afc title game to the patriots when people wanted to blame it all on the kicker billy cundiff for missing the field goal at the end of the game ray lewis sought to point out that no this was not the fault of one person or or, the, or one kicker the quote and his words were, I remember to this day, we win as a team, we lose as a team. This this is all this was. You know, people want, will want to easily, you know, do the lazy thing and say, oh, you know, they lost because of Dan Campbell. They did this. Should have taken the field goal. Should have went this. You know what? I'll say this. While it's easy, very much easy to uh, piggyback in retrospect and say, oh, you shouldn't have done this. Should have taken the points. It is not a guarantee that either one of those kicks would have worked because there's a reason why Badgley had been cut three times this year, this this season alone, including by the Lions the first time, by the way. There's a reason why that his career percentage and, and also career numbers on field goal kicks from 40 yards and above has been putrid, has been paltry, has been mediocre at best, putting it nicely. There's a reason why, even though... Yeah, you saw him get trusted with the, with the kick uh, against the Rams a couple weeks ago. That was indoors on turf. We're talking outdoors on grass, forty eight yards away. I don't know about you, but I'm taking. I'd rather have faith in my offense, knowing that this is a top ten, top five offense that can produce yards, get make big plays. And frankly, the trust was justified. It was the lack of execution that played into their downfall. And frankly. Um, you know, just if you want to talk about, well, you know, it, they, they could have easily making the kick. Yeah, I I, t- I turn your attention to Buffalo because last week they had a, gi- a gimme guarantee of a field goal, and that didn't work out for them either. So it's easy to retroactively criticize. Bass hooked that thing, by the way, it's, it's or easy, sliced it. It's easy to retroactively criticize, but it just comes off as lazy in my opinion. So, yes, the, 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 the fourth down decisions – by Campbell did hurt this team. It did put them in a bad spot. But between the other mistakes that I mentioned, um, that the word that had been a constant theme throughout the course of the season, it just unfortunately reared his ugly head again. And it would it's what led to uh this loss. Yeah, but I'm not gonna blame this on Campbell at all. He you only no. had two we only had two yards to gain on, on the first fourth down attempt. First failed four down, fourth down attempt. And on the second, he only had three. Goff was throwing nowhere. And even on the and, – and, again, it speaks to what I what I had a big issue of. On some of these crucial plays that allowed San Francisco to get constant stops, you notice what? They were just dropping back to pass, dropping back to pass, when for some reason they abandoned what had led to their big lead in the first place. What happened to establishing more on the ground with the running game? You saw what Jameer Gibbs was doing, even leading up to the fumble. You saw what David Montgomery was doing. He had a touchdown. You saw with what J-Mo did. Because what? That's how he got his touchdown. So above anything else, one main, main, painstakingly main reason as to why they lost this game, that or at least allowed San Francisco to get back to this game, not running the ball. That was their bread and butter. They had the offensive line for it. And for some reason whatsoever, or what, whatever reason why Ben Johnson or Dan Campbell or both decided to abandon the ground game, that was one reason that ended up costing them. Or one decision, I should say, that ended up costing them. Because that, they, they should not have done that above anything else. Because when you are have, trying to protect the lead, especially in, on the road in the playoffs, you want to be able to run the football. And while, you know... Once the thing, once momentum started rolling for San Francisco, it seemed like they were able to bottle up and bottle in on, on what Detroit was trying to do offensively. And also, I think the Lions also uh, they turtled uh, on a couple of those possessions because they had completely 
lost. They've been fra- they've been frazzled. They've just been they were just as frazzled um, from a mental standpoint in the second half the way San Francisco was in the first half, but it was worse. Because remember, this is a team you're going up against that has that experience of being in this game multiple times. You know, they've been to the Super Bowl themselves. So uh, even though you got this lead, you had to do whatever you could to keep your foot on the on, on the throat. And unfortunately, they just didn't, and it came back and bite them. It bit them. Yeah. The Lions have to start working on those, uh, on exercising those third quarter demons. It, they they played 30 minutes, not, 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 not 60 or 45, just 30 um, or 31 or 32 or whatever. That's not even close to being enough. You got to play 60 or close. Oh, to I that. will say it would help when, when you're trying, you know, it would help by opening up the, the, the playbook a little bit more in the third quarter, try to expand um, different routes, different uh, plays for different players. Go back, to, you know, you saw how the benefits of going to Jamison Williams early in the game worked. Why not go back to it? You know, because I was, yeah. you know, and, 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 and it shows a progress of how JMO has become the type of player that he's become uh, over the course of this season to where he's getting more reps, getting more games, getting more plays in, and you're seeing the results slowly but surely. Um, I wouldn't have minded giving him more chances, especially when you know, when you saw that, frankly, Laporta – was a bit limited in this game and to an extent St. Brown. Uh, and that's a credit to San Francisco with their defense. So once you saw that happening around you, for some reason, if you know, you're not trying to implement ways to get Jamal involved. I don't know what else to tell you. So that was on, that was on Ben Johnson to an extent. Yeah. Gotta. Uh, yeah. I gotta keep the uh, running game and Jamison Williams and uh, Jamison Williams, both flowing with your offense, especially if it, especially if it keeps working with you like it did the first half, and that and that's uh, and that's uh, how you uh, avoid those third quarter woes. By the way, for example, especially that's pretty much it. So it just ruins what was an, an incredible season for the Lions. The, the way they. It not not because the fact that they lost, but but because the way they lost. It was how it happened. Lead. Yeah, you. It was a dream start. This That's why I'm still day. sour about it. Uh, it's been a few days, Taylor, but I, I've let it settle in. You know, yes, the dream. It was a dream start. It was a nightmare finish. But if you look at it from the perspective of, hey, this is we now you have a motivation of where you want to get back to next year. Yes, it's going to be more difficult. Dan Campbell has acknowledged it. It is not a guarantee that you will get back to this spot. I'm sure, but it's not a guarantee that it's good, that it's that it's it's not a guarantee though that it's their only shot. They just have to uh, revamp their secondary, revamp themselves, revamp just uh, uh, get a get damn kicker. up their own game, up get their own damn, game. Get a damn kicker that would help. Yeah, a, a more reliable kicker. Although, exactly. ba- although Badgley has been hot, I admit it, but but it was still yeah. a difficult decision. But but the fact that you even you even made those decisions on fourth down told me all you need. Tell me all I need to know the fact that yeah, they do not trust their kicker at all. So why not? Feel- why not bring back have our kick it kickalicious Ro- Rogland? Yeah, good luck just with a- that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, sure. You know, I, 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 you know, the fact that they let Matt Prater go was a mistake that they're still regretting. Believe it or not, he may, may he may not be as good as he used to be, but I guarantee Prater's you, aging. That's why. Yes, but he yes, but he still would have been more reliable in that spot on Sunday, even even uh, at his current state than what we saw from Badgley. I know Just Justin saying. Tucker's going to stay with the Baltimore Ravens regardless, because mm. because I know because I. It, guys, because I know he doesn't want to go anywhere. Well, his 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 status has already been secure, but you know that that was that that, that was far from uh, any type of realistic possibility whatsoever. Right, exactly. So it just depends on who's available, frankly, because it's not exactly a, a supply market out there in terms of trying to find uh, good kickers or quality, reliable kickers. Right, but. The way they lost makes me feel so so sour that I that I'm not even con- I'm considering not watching the Super Bowl at all. Period. I don't give a damn who wins the game. 
Yeah, I can understand that part, and I wouldn't blame you, uh, and I wouldn't blame you, blame many uh, fans if they fall through on that same thought because, right, the wound is still fresh. It's still a little raw. I understand that disappointment. Trust me, I've lived through, we've lived through a, a multitude of Tigers choke jobs that was just as bad, if not worse than this. Especially 2006. Uh, 2013, I would say, was worse 2013 than 2013 as well. Combine them together and 2011. In 2012, yes. Yeah, 20, but yeah. Um, but for the Lions, yes, this was not the way you want you would have wanted your season to end after seeing how things had led up to this point. But the fact that this was still the first, you know, a year that you still had your first division title in 30 years. You had multiple pro, pro bowlers. You had a, an outstanding rookie class. Um, you have a coach that has established a culture that all of your players not only believe in, but are thriving in. And you have a future of a foundation set up to where you have a front office and management that fans believe and trust in. You have a general manager that knows how to do some of the right talent. And you have a coach and coaching staff uh, that is seemingly in the right place at the right time to where they have a short enough opening uh, to their window to where they can make something happen. We already saw what they did for this year. Now, obviously, you expect um, those goals and those expectations to raise for next year. But hey, it comes with the territory. We'll see what they what can do, what they can do to respond, and see if they can use what happened here as that right motivation to take to get them to, get, to go to that next level. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of coaches, Ben Johnson and Aaron Glenn stay put according uh, stay put according to. WXYZ TV channel seven in Detroit slash Southfield. So, well, that became apparent once both of the only two remaining uh, head coach openings, which was the uh, Seattle Seahawks and the Washington Commanders. Once those two got filled up, uh, Seattle decided to go with Mike McDonald, who, by the way, uh, reunited with his uh, former Michigan player, Mike Morris. Uh, and then the commanders decided to go with Dan Quinn, the defense coordinator for the Cowboys. That just confirmed uh, that Aaron Glenn was staying because Ben Johnson had already informed, uh, uh, I believe it was the Panthers. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it was Washington because Washington had flown in to Detroit to speak with them and with Aaron Glenn. And that's when Ben Johnson let them know that he would be staying with Detroit. So, frankly, that was a move uh, that surprised a lot of people. It, it, it definitely surprised me because I was expecting, especially after – knowing that he was in consideration for some potential openings last year, I thought the way that this, you know, that he followed up with that was just as an impressive, if not better performance from the offense this season. The fact that you got immense production from your rookies and you got the NFC championship game. Uh, and you somewhat argue you should have been playing in the game next week or two weeks from now, but still, all that led, would lead you to reasonably expect to say, hey, you're gone. You're going to another team. But the fact that he said, no, he wants to stay, at least give it one more, uh, one more go around, uh, speaks a lot to um, the message that he, he has to buy and believe in in regards to this whole entire organization. And also, you have to believe a sense of, you know what, I got unfinished business. It, it, yep, it exactly. That, it, those it, are the key. It, it, those are the keywords. Business is not finished yeah, until you win the Super Bowl. Happen. You yeah, win man. the Super Bowl. More, more keywords there, right? Just can't help but feel that. I mean, like I said, we know what the goal is now. Has to be for next year. It has to be to get back to this game. You want to add on incentives, like say, hey, maybe see what you can do to try and get it to be hosted at home. It almost happened this year. Not for those damn Packers, but you know, if you want to say, "Hey, you want to have, we want to host it at home, we want to try to get a one seed," all that is good and good and plenty. But the main priority is find whatever you can do to get back to the MC Championship game. Period. Exactly. Um, yeah, just. Uh, but that, that, but that's on Brad Holmes to uh, to uh, re revamp the uh, secondary and probably. Uh, at least some parts of the uh, some other parts of the defense and some parts of the uh, offense as well with the draft and free agency and whatnot. 
Well, I would say the the obviously the, the the bigger the main priority of what should be the target of what Brad Holmes should be doing is the defense. Clearly, um, we did see them make immense steps in terms of being much much better against the run this year. Uh, even in the playoffs, when you saw them facing the lights of, of Curran Williams or, and Christian McCaffrey, of all players, uh, their run defense, I thought, held up as best as they possibly could. Obviously, there's weak, there's weaknesses in the secondary that needs to be addressed. I think Major man, weaknesses. Major. You know, yeah, that's, that goes For years saying. upon years, it's been major. That goes without saying. But when – so when you factor in players like, for example, I think Emmanuel Mosley, I don't think he's going to be getting another contract to the fact that what uh, he had a, re- a reoccurring ACL injury happened for this season. So I don't know at how much stock that's going to put into him wanting to be brought back for another year uh, with Detroit. I do see a potential much more better chance for C.J. Gardner-Johnson. It just depends on whether or not it's going to be a one another one-year deal, one-year deal or not. I would say more than likely yes because due to the fact that he only played a certain amount of games this year. Like he played the first two games uh, at the start, then he got hurt, went on IR, didn't come back till mm-hmm. damn near the end of the season anyway. So we only got, in in essence, a sample size of what we could, what CJ could bring to the team. Um, I do know he had some interceptions. Two of them. Yeah. What? What in the, the regular season? What in the playoffs? He almost I had an. And he almost had another one against against Kansas City uh, in the open game of, of the year too. So I feel I feel with a full season under his belt, we could see um, an overall positive production of what CJ Gardner Johnson brings to that secondary. Not to mention his experience and 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 his knowledge in that field and with the safety room that you have already with Kirby Joseph, with Defatu Melifonwu, with Brian Branch. Um, that could be a, a needed lead voice, not just for that room, but for that defense in general. And I think, um, based on that overall, I, w- I would give CJ another year. And uh, I would say this will be another prove it, a one year proved deal. As yeah, that's fair to, enough. I'd yeah, give as, one as opposed two. to multi years. So I would bring yeah. I would bring back CJ, but just for one year. Hopefully they teach him and the other uh, secondary defenders mental discipline. You got to play the ball and not the body, and and you can't leave them leave wide receiver keep leaving wide receivers wide open. You keep giving up deep, deep big passing plays. Well, I think that, that, that just I think that's happened the, so many times. I think that comes with the territory of Aaron Glenn recognizing. Listen. The best we could do, for, because we noticed for the first half, first half of the season, they were very conservative with their coverage, with whether or not they brought pressure. Second half of the season, much more aggressive, much more aggressive, much more blitzing. Um, and you saw, I thought, the, the benefits that that came as a result of that. Um, now, as terms of what you can do to improve on the secondary, there's still things you can do. Uh, Cover the receiver. This, no, well, again. All that's well and Danny, but frankly, you can only do so much when, again, I reiterate, and I will keep reiterating this like a dead horse, your second, your your pass rush has to get home, period. If you're disrupting the quarterback's timing and making life help from the backfield, it's going to make things much easier on your secondary. When the QB does not have time to get out that ball, he's either rushing it or he's being, you know, Right. Like you said, hassled or whatever, it's going to lead to potential big play for the defense, whether it be a turnover or a, or a pass breakup or an incomplete pass on a third down, some of that effect. So if I am Brad Holmes, I'm looking at the situation of I can find myself another corner in the draft. I may be able to find myself another good cheap corner in free agency. But if I'm going to make a major upgrade on my defense – I got to spend some money on the defensive line. I've got to get myself another pass yes, rusher. Yes, exactly. Yeah, another pass rusher opposite Aiden Hutchinson. Yeah, it, but it, yeah, if the quarterback has time in the pocket or 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 can still scramble, then then he's still gonna that well, find, we saw, find somebody open. We anyway, we saw that. We saw that obviously a lot with friggin' Brock Purdy running. Sometimes around like that has happened, yards. and that that that's the issue, and that's where the that's where the second. It, but it, it again, but I that, still, this is, I still the, argue. It's I a Justin. I would still argue that's where you still need 
that other person on the D line to finish that play for you. Because like you said, to help like, Hutchinson and James yeah. Houston, I was going to say, yeah. but I'm talking about the just in case factor for the secondary that, well, hey, that's they, where if anything you need you you need to have one of your linebackers um, in, or, or in one case of your in in case the pass rush doesn't get home. It's not going to get home all the time. True, obviously, but that's where you have to adjust. You have to have a back of a sword, like having one of your linebackers or one of your nickel corners be a designated spy. Exactly. Got to gotta, gotta yeah. stay up. Got to stay on that. your man like a hawk. I can agree with that, but again, like I said, you can that's only part that. of your job. You can only do that for so long on an extended play. So I agree with you. Yes, the cover, the covers still have the the corners still have to cover, but again, only you only do so much because once it starts breaking down after four or five plays, that lets you know that your defensive pass rush did not do their job. So it always starts and ends with the trenches, Taylor. That's all I'm trying to trying to preach. I understand your your philosophy and your side of things, but I got we got, but I know for a fact. Especially right. if you're looking at what, what we do on the offensive line. That is primary, line. yes. Yes, the primary, exactly. The primary and then the secondary slash just in case. It starts, it, but it always starts in the trenches. That's why you saw our offensive line exactly. be so, all, so dominant. That's why you saw how we were so effective at stopping the run. Once you get that other pass rusher on the opposite side of Aiden Hutchinson that can bring production, bring havoc, bring more disruption, timely disruption to the quarterback that makes things easier for your defense, pure and simple. Exactly. So that, so uh, again, that, that solve that solves everything. So Charles and Will Harris, the unrestricted free agents, mm -hmm. CJ Gardner Johnson, which we already mentioned, we're both willing to give him one more year, just to be fair. Dan Skipper, Donovan Peoples Jones. Yep. Oh, oh, of course. He's out of the question. Uh, but but I'll, but we'll keep an eye. We'll keep our eyes on on all of them anyway, including him. I, Donovan I, Donovan Peoples Jones. Emmanuel Mosley. Is he? Wonder if he's going to come back after suffering a season ending season ending season ending injury. Greg Glasgow. Halapulavati Vitai. Is he going to come back? Injury prone, I guess. But by Jalen, time I, mm -hmm. by time I retire because he was already considering retirement last year, and that was due to those uh, uh, lingering issues, like like the back injury, which is what ended his season early this year again. So I don't know if Vitai wants to give it one more go. More props to him. It will bring depth to our offensive line, but you know I just want to make sure for his sake that he's making the right choice for his health sake. Yep. Yep. And but. Uh, anyway, Jalen Reeves, Jalen Reeves, Maven, mm -hmm. Jonah Jackson, Josh Reynolds. Are are we willing to give him one more year after those two drops? Yes, yes, yes. He just had a bad moment. He's been user reliable. Not to mention that Jared Goff uh, had his back in the post game press conference. Afterwards. That's what I so, thought. So uh, I, I, I saw him. I saw him make critical catches in the regular season. Exactly. You know, while so, so. it's far too in the moment and using emotion to, to take that out on Reynolds. If anything, you yep. need to use this as a chance to build up his confidence to where once we see him in that spot again next season, he can be more reliable. But I don't think that shouldn't be a, a problem because let's say, for example, Jameson Williams takes another step forward and becomes that definitive uh, wide receiver number two behind Amon Ross St. Brown. We know that JMO isn't going to be the top, isn't the, the top two receiving option because what you got Laporta. You saw what he did this year. So now we know that between St. Brown, he's the number one wide out, number one target period. And now you see with Laporta. Okay, what can we do? What's going to be your second wide out option? For a while, we saw that being Josh Reynolds. I think for next year, we're going to see that have that be Jameson Williams. But even still, um, I would still bring back Josh Reynolds mainly because of that connection that he has had uh, throughout the years with Jared Goff, going back to the days with the Rams. I'd give him at least one year, yeah, just for that sake. So, K Kendall Vildor uh, is he going to be? Yeah, I we'll mean, go. We're going to go he, over one by one. Yeah, I'll let you be the judge of them. Well, here I'll go. I'll start with, with first and foremost at the at the top of the list. Uh, 
Ah, Will Harris. I could see Will Harris being brought back for a practice squad, practice squad deal. Charles Harris, not sure. CJ, uh, CD Deuce, I'll bring him back on a one-year deal. Dan Skimmer, definitely bring him back. Donovan Peoples-Jones, I'll be honest, was not impressed with his production and output. I would not bring him back personally. Um, I think you could find you could find another uh, wide receiver around that size. I wonder if DPJ didn't get enough playing time. Well, again, he was a, a, a last. He was a mid-season acquisition after the trade deadline. So, right. And advantage, if, if anything, it was done for for depth on the wide receiver purposes. So it wasn't more so getting him involved. But I think you still need, if you're going to not bring him back, you still need to get a, a receiver. Who knows? Maybe you get you find one in the draft that that represents that big body downfield vertical threat. Because or while, slash kick or click or kick slash punt returner. By yeah. The way. Yeah, you can use that too because apparently, you know, now that, that, that's, that's one now, of the regardless that depends one on of the, not. that is one of the fact that that is one of the uh, roles that DPJ played. By the true, way, true, true, but uh, it also de- depends on whether or not because I remember reading a report of saying there could be some considerations of the Lions potentially putting JMO into the special teams packages next year. So we'll see how that works out. But uh, let's see, Dan, DPJ, I lean towards no. Manuel Mosley, definitely no. Uh, back-to-back years, ACL surge, ACL injuries. Yeah, that speaks to a, a level of reliability that makes me uncomfortable. Graham Glasgow. Now, Graham Glasgow, I had heard uh, that both he and the Lions were working on towards finalizing a potential new contract in the offseason. So look out for that. By Ty, I already discussed with you. I think he more than likely he retires. Uh, In addition to Teddy Bridgewater, yeah, Teddy Bridgewater. He's already, you know, it's already been confirmed he's retired, uh, or what is retiring and was retiring. Uh, since That's why he's being ended. mentioned. Um, yes. So Reeves Maven absolutely bring him back. Uh, very crucial uh, to the special teams, to say the least. The special teams unit with the amount of plays that he made for them with the fake punts and whatnot. And also time and plays on defense, too, because that's what he was drafted at originally at the linebacker spot. Jonah Jackson purpose. Yeah. Jonah Jackson is an interesting one because I could see reasons why they, you could bring him back. And I can also see reasons why you don't have to bring them back, especially when you consider the fact that, you know, you can always draft yourself another offensive lineman in the draft. You can go younger. You can keep up your depth. That way, would I have to worry about overpaying, you know, your offensive line? Because guess what? Uh, I don't know if you're going to be doing this next this next year or not, but Sewell's going to want a new contract. He's going to want an extension. You know, are you sure you're going to want to have to do all that, knowing pay all this money to Jackson, knowing full well that what you got to turn right back around soon and give Sewell his money? So I would say. Uh, Jonah Jackson, pay attention to that. I would not be upset or surprised if we don't bring him back. If we do, cool. If not, I won't be hurt. Reynolds, I've said yes. Vildor, I'm iffy on, especially after what we uh, after I saw him drop that interception. And yeah, or pass opposing yeah. pass exactly uh especially speaking badly like i said pass you know i said you got to upgrade at kicker like i said if, if if you had a different kicker there or at least a more reliable kicker in that spot you wouldn't be dan campbell would not have made those decisions all on fourth down i guarantee you yeah, um, riley riley patterson he, he's not he's not listed as a as an upcoming for unrestricted free agent but no and we and, and we cut him before we even uh, went went to badgley so oh yeah that's um, right romeo quara i could say i could see lean towards no i don't see him being brought back now and it, and, it, and this all speaks to the fact that uh you have to consider either potential mm-hmm. roster spots and or money slash cap space that you don't want to tie down to certain players or if you want to save up to try and get another player so that's why I mentioned the possibility of, hey, you know what? I may not give Jonah Jackson the contract that he made to desire or may want or desire, but that's only because, hey, I may be thinking of trying to go after a Brian Burns or a, De- or a Daniil Hunter or a Josh Allen in, in, in free oh, agency. Josh, oh, Josh. A, different, a different Josh Allen, right? Yes, the, 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 defense, the defensive end for the Jaguars. There we go. You're wondering. Exactly. Yeah, not not the Josh Allen that Buffalo 
Buffalo Bills fans especially are thinking. Yeah. And then and then finally you got that long snapper by the name of Jake McQuaid. Yeah, bring which, him back. Why not? Yeah, I got no problem bringing him back. But like I yeah. said, between listen, between the fact that you have sixty million dollars in cap space, you have four of the top four picks in the first three rounds and first hundred picks of the, of the draft. Um and knowing what you're going to do and want to do with certain players, uh, namely Jared Goff, for example, with his contract, you like you expect that to get finalized sooner rather than later. You should have faith at the, what the Lions can do and what, can, what they can provide and what they can bring because we've seen them come this far based on the plan that they've established. It sucks now. Yes, it still stings at the moment, but if you use this as that, uh, that last step of motivation to get to that final level, then it will be worth it in the end. Remember, the Red Sox in 2003, they were already cursed. They had already been a long-suffering franchise. They had to go through that one last stumble before finally breaking through. Those those 2011 Ravens I mentioned to you, very next year, they won the Super Bowl. So there, there are instances that we have seen before to where other teams, it wasn't just their only shot. They did make it back. And they only not only made it back, they got they won it, and they they went on to do better, uh, bigger and better things as a result of that. So I do firmly believe that this is something that they can easily just as you know. Well, not I can't say easily because it won't be easy, but it no. is something that is plausible and possible for the Detroit Lions to do. Exactly, they just have to up their own game, and mm-hmm. totally and and completely. So yeah, I I think the Lions are gonna extend Jared Goff. There's no question about that. Oh, yeah, it's just a matter of of the, the the amount of money, the terms, and the years. Yeah, I, I think Goff will go. I think Goff will go with either with any amount and stay. So mm, I won't say that. I think he will. He'd want to be well compensated. So I think uh, at least fifty million for sure. Oh, I mean, it's got it's got to be high. It's got to be high, regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what I meant. Mm-hmm. Any high amount. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're and they're gonna offer him any high amount. That that's one thing for sure. So as they should, he's earned it. Yeah, of of course. That the only one weakness that Goff has to uh, exercise is not scrambling. They. He has to some it's sometimes in case of emergency when you don't find anybody opening you're under under pressure try try keeping the football and rushing it yourself again golf can only do so much because he's not exactly what you call an athlete or an athletic um dual threat type of quarterback so he's gonna do the type of play that he's always done his whole career and frankly it's worked out well for him this year in the past couple of years in, in Detroit rather right 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 I mean, I mean, when the, there's at least one hole open, but but really, I know what you mean. The Michigan State Spartans beat the Michigan Wolverines eighty-one sixty-two. I know, I know, uh, I know you're for Michigan, but really, I got at least I have to hand respect for uh, Tom Izzo's seven hundred seven hundredth career win on his 69th birthday, and that was, that was at the Prison Center, by the way. Jay Nakins, red hot from three, seven of ten. From behind the arc, 23 points. That that's that is that's about it for that it game. It was it was about it, but it was it was a necessary uh, it was a good milestone moment for Izzo. Uh, he does he does become the uh, 38th coach in NCAA history to record 700 or more wins. Uh, very pristine elite company. Uh, that leaves him in, you know, as if he wasn't a guaranteed Hall of Famer before this, right? Um, so while that's much of a high point, as you can say, for Izzo and Michigan State, because this has, has not exactly been the best of years for them, uh, considering the fact that they were facing high hype coming into the year of saying, hey, this could be a potential Final Four team, and they've yet to live up to that mantle. Uh, I will say they're still doing far, far better than what Michigan's doing because, in my opinion, this is an absolute low point, not just for this team, but for this program um, for the past going on three years now because now as a result of this game, this marks your sixth straight loss to Michigan State. You have lost eight of your last 12 against them. 
Now, as a result of this game, you're now for this season currently two and eight in the conference, which, by the way, has you dead last at all. Oh, my God. Dead (laughs) last. Dead last is right. Seven and 14, dead last in the Big Ten. And that's a massive fall considering the fact that just three years ago, this team won the Big Ten championship outright, regular season champs, went had a deep run in the tournament, went to the Elite Eight, and then what they do after that? 2022, barely over 500, four wins, you know, a, a 19 to 15 record. They missed, you know, they get to the tournament, uh, but they don't even get past the Sweet 16. Then 2023, 18 and 16, missed the tournament. NIT, they get bounced in the second round. Now look at what we're at for, for this year so far. As I mentioned, the Apple mentioned seven and fourteen, dead last in the Big Ten. Uh, the culture has um, vanished. Vanished. It has lost its way. Um, completely different than what we saw, obviously under John Beeline. It is slowly, uh, it's, uh, instead of being prolonged and continued, it has clearly uh, been whittled and eroded away. I'm not sure if that's necessarily a fault with Jawan Howard or these coaches or these players in general, uh, but that uh, connection or relaying the message clearly got lost somewhere along the way. And it's now led to a point to where you can say it. Jawan Howard, he has completely dropped the ball. I don't know. You're looking at situations like players are getting suspended, but they can play – games at home but not play on the road it's just a mess it is an embarrassing mess you know whenever Juwan Howard is not you know trying to punch coaches he's right apparently yelling at players at practice so it, it's it's becoming one thing after another to where you just wonder when is the other shoe going to drop and when is Juwan Howard going to be let know that his services will no longer be needed uh, and frankly, if I'm Ward Manuel, I don't, I don't envy, I do not envy being him right about now because he's got to answer for this because this was his move, his call to hire Juwan Howard. Uh, we've seen how it has played out in, in the in the five years or so since, and what he lost Jim Harbaugh. So if you're if you're a fan of Michigan sports, Michigan athletics, I can understand Ward Manuel uh, being at the uh, top of your shit list so to speak, right now if you're a Michigan fan. But, uh, hey, you can ride with the ebbs and flows of momentum. I understood what the reality of what going back to this basketball season was going to be after the football season was over. But, hey, that's okay. You still got the 15-0. and You still got the natty. Exactly. And that's why Harbaugh earned that hiring by the L.A. Chargers, by the way. Like I said again, like I said a while ago, So, yeah, some January that we had. Speaking of basketball, the Pistons are 6-41. and Uh, They uh, almost beat the Cavaliers, but uh, they they just collapsed, of course, like they usually do. It's still – there's not much else to see. Not much to say, but fortunately we did see uh, this uh, in this past week the return of Kate Cunningham. This was his yeah. first amount of action that we've seen since I believe it was the seventh of January against Denver. Uh, was dealing with a, a, a knee strain, I believe it was a left knee strain, missed a few games, but he came back. Um, I will say though, even though the team lost, Cade had a tremendous game against Cleveland. Zero turnovers. You want to see that happening more and more consistently. Also, another thing that's been happening more consistently is three point shots getting better. Uh, yes. He's been. He hasn't been going. He hasn't been going too crazy with the amount of with the amount of, of shots he's taken, but he's been efficient whenever he does take them. And so that's something you wanted to see. Uh, that's an improvement on his game. Uh, it speaks to his development. So um, very much happy that w- w- what I got out of Cade. Granted, you wish you could it would spread to the rest of the team, but uh, hey, that's what happens when you when you put together a team the way that Troy you has put together. And clearly we've seen that it's been for worse instead of for better. Yeah. And then the Red Wings, they lost to the uh, last place Ottawa Senators 3-2 to two in overtime at Little Caesars Arena. They, it, The Red Wings played down to their competition. That's why 
play way down to the uh, opposing competition. That's why they keep losing to the Senators, especially at home. They lost five to one earlier in the the season, and now this. This is this just those type of types of losses to that bottom feeder team are it's unacceptable. It's frustrating. It's it's definitely unacceptable. But to look on one side, on the uh, positive side of things, despite that loss, the Red Wings still finished January with a record of nine two and two. So that's what nine wins, oh, yeah. two overtime losses. That's about what twenty points that they've gotten in that one month span. And with the All Star break coming up. I think that's a, a perfect chance to look back at, at terms of what you've done well so far and what you still need to get better at. You like the fact that um, Alex Brinkett is our only representative at the All-Star game. Uh, nice. he, he, is, he is a part of uh, Team Austin Matthews. And frankly, with what he's done in terms of being an absolute offensive machine, he's got 43 points in the 50 games that he's played this year, including 18 goals. Uh, I think with a player like Austin Matthews on uh, as the captain of one of the teams, he made a very good pick with bringing uh, to bring it on board. I think it, his style would fit well with what uh, team he's trying to put together. Um, there's other good things for the Wings too. The fact that Alex Lyon has been looking like a godsend, it, it seems, with his performance in net. He's currently listed in terms of uh, ranked rather, I'd say, in, in the top ten of, in goals allowed average. His record were were seven wins above. Uh, above 500 whenever he starts, whenever he plays, and he's got two shutouts. My goodness, imagine what our regular would look like if we went to him earlier. He's incredible. But, but regardless, you know, we're still holding on to one of those two wild card spots. Where we're essentially tied uh, with the same amount of points with the Maple Leafs, and we're in fact six points above the next closest team. So things are looking very good in terms of week. Uh, uh, the Red Wings potentially getting closer to that to that playoff spot, but you still want to see what they can do uh, at the at the at the deadline, adding more help defensive on the defensive side of things, especially considering the fact that Moritz Sider, their defenseman, is is the way he's been playing in certain shifts, certain zones. You know, uh, analytics and metrics look at it one way; um, others will look at it at another way. But still, it is. The fact that he's been in the defensive zone is primarily the way that he has has led to um, one reason or another, more teams getting more shots than us. And once you see that constantly happen and that, that amount of barrage over time is going to wear you down. So if you're the Red Wings, you got to look forward towards getting proper, even, you know, I would say look at trying to get another goaltender depth uh, because from what, even though, uh, Husos and, and Grand Rapids right now, he's still got to rebuild that trust for me. So I would say looking to try and get another goaltender and for sure. To uh, back up Lion, yeah. Yeah. Is deal Rhyme, deal Reimer first. And for sure, get yourself another forward uh, that will give you some help on the, on, on the defensive side of things. So I think you yeah. have enough. You got some defensive def- defensemen uh, that, that you can call up, like Edvinson, that can, that can be that uh, provided help back up. Uh, for cider, I think you just got to try to see if you can bring in a forward from, from the deadline. Yeah, what one thing that has stood out, one player that has stood out to me as of late, Andrew Cop. Mm-hmm. He has 10 goals on the year. Mm-hmm. Trying to look at the assist 14 assists, 24 points, that, and a plus three in 49 games played. That that that's uh, at least an improvement for Andrew Cop. He's getting better. Well, at least at least somewhat better, if yeah, if not just slightly. I could agree with that. So he's he's you need, you need, he's you need your to, other role players to back up. It can't just be the Brinkett and Kane and Larkin all day. You know, you need your, your Lucas Raymonds, your Coppers, your Cops, your Sprongs, your Perones. You need those Rasmussen's. guys. Yeah, you know, your Rasmussen's. You need those guys to help you out uh, bit by bit. Exactly. And this is the all-star break, of course. The Red Wings 26, 18, and 6 with 58 points in 50 games played. The Maple Leafs 58 points in 47 games played. They own the t- so they own the tiebreaker for the first Eastern Eastern Conference wildcard spot. As uh, and of course the Red Wings second place, the uh, second wildcard spot in the East. Fifth fifth in the not so Atlantic division. 
So that that's everything. What did we learn this week? We learned that the Lions were frankly uh, a year ahead of schedule of the plan they of that they wanted to build themselves in. And while they have gotten so advanced, they're not quite there yet. They needed that reminder of what they still need to do, what they need to get better at, what they need to fill out on, uh, and then they'll be truly ready to contend for that championship. But for now, you can still be proud of the season that they had, still be very much satisfied of what they were able to pull off after so many years and decades of futility, and still be happy and I would say optimistic and excited for what the future can bring. Uh, what we learned for the Pistons is that Kate Cunningham is still going to do his best to lead this team as uh, as much as he can until he gets more help surrounded him. What we learn is that the Red Wings are looking to be right on schedule in terms of making the potentially making the playoffs, which was so sorely needed uh, at, by this point for the Steve Eisenman era. And we learned that, frankly, Michigan basketball is at uh, its biggest low point since the departure of John Beeline. Yep. And and um, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. What what was that other player's name that uh, that that uh, transferred like a couple years ago? It was a center. Hunter Dickinson. Hunter, Hunter Dickinson, thank you. Yeah, trust me. Dickinson was basically carrying this program as if, from what we can tell because as soon as he left, everything has completely went into the ditch. Yeah, true. So what I learned, the Lions, like you said, are, they're not quite there yet. They need to learn how to play 60 minutes, not 30, not 45, but 60 or close to it. And they learned the hard way in that NFC Championship game where they choked to the 49ers at Levi Stadium. This is where all units have to step up. Especially, it, it there. of course, there's the halftime break. They could, But anyway, it, it's a 60-minute game, but it doesn't matter what seed you play. Even if you're not the number one seed, and if you and if you are, it, it still doesn't guarantee anything. You got to play to win the Super Bowl. Whether you're a one seed or a three seed, two seed, four seed, five, six, seven, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Play the game and keep playing until you either win the whole thing or lose out. That's that's just the way it works. The Red Wings. They're, they're, they're getting up there. Andrew Kopp, like I said, he, he's somewhat improving. They, they just have to uh, they just have to uh, stop taking bottom team feeders for granted and start beating up beating them more and not and stop playing down to their competition. If they do that that then they'll be uh, more then they'll be more of a playoff. Then, then they may may even prove that they may may even make a deeper playoff run in the future. Nothing to learn for the Pistons here. They're just still the Pistons right now. Michigan basketball. It's time for Juwan Howard to go. Of course, Tom Izzo may not may not retire anytime soon. Still, he still got. I think he still has a, at least a little bit left up on the tank at age sixty nine. By the way, so. That is what we've learned on another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. I'm Taylor Phillips. He's Ed Smith. Follow the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on X and Instagram at Michigan underscore truth and like its Facebook page. Subscribe to its YouTube channel at the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Like our videos and turn on all notifications on the bell icon. Follow it and listen to it in audio form on Spreaker. Follow me on X, Instagram, and TikTok and YouTube at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on X, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube at EdSmith313. Business shout-outs go to Athletical Physical Therapy on Woodward and Ferndale, the B4 Foundation, Burke's Waterfront Restaurant and Cadillac, Cali Tickets, call, call Mark Goldman at 877-225-8425 or visit calitickets.com. A former sponsor of what was the Detroit Sports Rag, by the way, 
creative embroidery of Cadillac for designing the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast logo on my long sleeve shirt and t-shirt each. Cuts by Melanie in Lake City. I thought my appointment was today, but I but I read the text wrong. Sorry, Melanie. Rosted. It is actually February 8th at 2.30 p.m. Let's roll with it. Rolled ice cream in Cadillac. The flavor of the week is chocolate strawberry in tribute ahead of time to Valentine's Day. Follow them on TikTok at the Food Mafia LLC and on Instagram at the Food Mafia Rolled Ice Cream. Northern Star Event Rentals in Cadillac, 231-884-8195. And on Facebook, Union Barber in Birmingham. United Food Service Solutions of Grand Ledge, Michigan. United Mobile Power Wash and Dry, work and dry ice, ice Works in Southfield. And Wellbeing with Catherine Palms, a, a yoga and face yoga instructor in the uh, Northwest Bay Area of the Mitten in Traverse City. Our next episode, next Thursday at 10.30 p.m. Until then, for Ed Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips signing off. But remember, we observe and detect the truth about Michigan sports. Stay on the lookout, stay aware, hit them with a high. Take care and be safe, everybody.